Good evening. I'm Robin Garrell, the president of the City University of New York Graduate Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to another public conversation. Great biographies do much more than describe the lived experience and trajectory of their subjects. They have the power to illuminate history, to inform the present, and to influence readers who will shape the future. Since 2007, the Leon Levy Center for Biography at the CUNY Graduate Center has focused on the biographers themselves and their work, amplifying the achievements of authors who are already established and attracting and training talented new biographers who will write about their subjects from their own unique perspectives. Tonight's discussion will center on a new book that examines many dimensions of one of the most influential people of our time, a person whose life is too wide ranging and multifaceted to be captured through just a single lens. It makes sense that George Soros, A Life in Full, is the work of many contributors, each examining Soros from a different perspective. At the Graduate Center, we welcome this approach. Our students and faculty are known for their interdisciplinary scholarship and collaborations. Our classrooms and degree programs, including our master's program in biography and memoir, actively invite participation of diverse voices. Tonight, we are joined by several contributors to the kaleidoscopic portrait of George Soros. To welcome our panelists, I'm pleased to introduce Kai Bird, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Biography and the executive director of the Leon Levy Center. Kai? Yes, good evening. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, my name is Kai Bird. I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution uh, hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and uh, founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. Has my video started? Yes, okay. Uh, <clears throat> Anyway, I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will take place on Tuesday, March 22nd at 6 p.m. when Professor David Nassau will lead a roundtable discussion on radical biographies. Please mark your calendars and register for this event on the Leon Levy website, and please encourage your friends and relatives to subscribe to our digital mailing list on our website. But tonight we are gathered for yet another roundtable discussion, this one focused on the life and career of George Soros. Uh, the discussion will be guided by Peter Osnos, the editor of a newly published volume of biographical essays entitled George Soros, A Life in Full. Osnos will be in conversation with three of the contributors to this collection, Leon Botstein, Eva Hoffman, and Sebastian Malaby. Peter Osnos is the founder of Public Affairs. Before embarking on book publishing, Osnos had a long journalistic career, starting out at IF Stones Weekly and ending as a senior editor at the Washington Post. He is the author of An Especially Good View, Watching History Happen, a delightful memoir published just last summer. Uh, so please look for all of these books at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. Our panel, panelists will be in conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we will take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the question box below to type in your questions, and Peter will be sure to get to as many as he can. We will try to end this program after about one hour or so. Again, thanks to Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. And now I turn this conversation over to Peter Osnos. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Peter, you're, you're still muted. There you go. Yeah, yep, no. No, you're still muted. <laughs> Click on your the lower left hand. Mute. Mic. How's that? Yeah, you had it. There okay, we go. Good, good, good. Excellent. You know, you know how fond I am, Kai. We've talked about this a lot. How fond I am about these Zoom uh, 
apparatus side. It's a new world and we have to engage with it virtually. Well, George certainly would if he had to. Uh, in fact, that's one of George's many attributes. He has learned how. Now I wanna be sure that, uh, Leon, are you there? I'm here. All right, All right. we've assembled. And what, what's really quite remarkable, and I suppose the upside of this is that uh, Leon's in at, at Bard and Ava is in, and, and Sebastian are both in Europe. Uh, so really it reflects the sort of global reach that uh, George Soros represents. Uh, I think that what we're going to try to do in the time we have, uh, we all essentially know what George has done. And the book jacket lists the kind of basic categories of his life. Survivor, billionaire, speculator, philanthropist, philosopher, political activist, nemesis of the far right, and global citizen. And it was our judgment that rather than try to have one person embrace so much, we would go to people who have really deep knowledge of understanding of the various aspects of, of George's life. And, and of the people we asked to contribute and have done in my humble judgment as the editor of Marvelous Job, we have three this evening. Ava Hoffman is the author of the classic Lost in Translation, which to caption, basically describes what it is like to be a person who loses one's homeland and starts over uh, elsewhere. And of course, that is exactly what happened with George. Sebastian, who is uh, the author of recently published The Power Law about the history of, of, of VCs, and is in fact a leading writer on matters of finance and so on. And Leon Botstein, who is the president of Bard, leading orchestra conductor, and a man who, among many, many other things, knows George really, really well. Uh, the book is made up of those essays. And what I'd like to do tonight, very briefly, is ask each of the three of you, Ava, Sebastian and Leon, a question which will help uh, the viewers understand exactly what it is you've done in your book. So Ava, George says, I'm gonna call him Soros. I keep trying to remember that his name is Soros. <laughs> I know him, you can call him George, but that's not appropriate when you're doing something like this. So Soros always says that the most important year of his life was 1944. He was 14. The Nazis were in Hungary where George and his family, where Soros and his family lived. What he says is that 1944 gave him a capacity for handling risk, danger, that has served him really well in so many other ways. So Ava, first of all, welcome and thank. Can you express to us in a Tight way, what it was about 1944 that made George the person he became. Right, <laughs> I will try. Well, I mean, you know, the the the, the uh, great fact to know is that uh, this he was 14 uh, in <clears throat> 1944, uh, and this was the year when the Holocaust really arrived. The Nazis arrived in Hungary and the Holocaust arrived in Hungary. Uh, George and his older, uh, Soros and his older brother were in hiding with his father. Um, and, you know, George had always said that he was, you know, protected from danger by his father. He trusted his father implicitly and completely. He adored his father. Um, so in a way he felt protected from danger, but you know, he also said that we were on the side of the angels and this was you know, quite important. They were on the right side morally. Uh, he also learned um, how to 
he learned that he could cope with danger. And, you know, he was in some very risky situations uh, in which he behaved with, you know, great sort of coolness of mind and, you know, and, and, and great um, uh, really bravery. Um, <clears throat> it, you know, and he, he saw both the, the Holocaust, the arrival of the Nazis, and towards the end, the arrival of the Russians, who perpetrated their share of atrocities, although, you know, they were the supposed liberators, they were the liberators from the Nazis. Uh, so it was, you know, it, it was a, a kind of adventure for a 14 year old young man. Uh, it was an adventure. Uh, and, it, you know, it was a time during which he saw his father, hand, you know, handle various kinds of decisions, various, various kinds of risks. Um, it, with sort of, you know, informed trust in his judgment. Uh, Tivadar trusted his judgment implicitly and he actually rarely made mistakes, but it was a judgment, you know, informed by a lot of experience, a lot of historical experience, a lot of human experience. Um, so, you know, in a sense, George uh, learned this as well. Uh, he, and he learned how to handle risks. Uh, he actually also learned something about financial speculation uh, or fi fin finances in any case uh, during the period of the Russian occupation when they were out of hiding. Uh, and when he was um, a, recruited by somebody to exchange uh, the Hungarian currency for a better currency for the dollar, probably. And he saw that there were two different places in which the exchange rates were different. And this was, you know, very, uh, very informative. Uh, but, you know, in a sense, he learned how to trust his instincts, how to trust his judgment, how to trust, how to make instinctive and quick decisions. Uh, which always were also, you know, very ethically informed. Um, and I think, you know, we can see the influence of this in his later career, for example, in the way that he handled the Open Society Foundations and the way that he, you know, um, entrusted the running of the Open Society Foundations to the people in the various countries where they were cited, but he trusted his judgment in assigning it to the, you know, to the particular people. Um, and he trusted them to know how to take uh, risks. And as far as I can tell, Sebastian uh, from USA, he also took enormous risks uh, in his financial career. And well, that is exactly where we're going to go right now, Ava. Oh, okay. Um, Sebastian, uh, Soros calls himself a speculator, um, which in most people's judgment is not an encomium. Uh, he's also, I think, the originator of the hedge funds. And certainly that is the thrust of your essay. And what is a hedge fund? It's, it's, it requires a capacity for handling risks, danger, and analysis of a certain kind. What is it about Soros the speculator that enabled him to become Soros the hedge fund pioneer? And as we know, many, 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 many times over, a billionaire. I think he had three qualities, Peter. Um which set him up to be a wonderfully successful speculator. Um, the first quality was that he had a global outlook, you know, coming from the fact that he'd grown up in Central Europe, he spoke French, he spoke German, he'd gone via London to the United States. So by the time he began to trade, most people in that time in a world of capital controls traded their own countries, they didn't trade across borders. 
he from the beginning had a different view and that made him distinctive. Um, the second thing he had was a view that markets are not actually efficient. His coming of age as a speculator coincided with the ascendancy of the efficient market hypothesis. Um, the 50s, 60s and 70s were when that view of financial markets that basically they incorporate all the information that there is out there already. So to beat them, you probably have to be lucky. Uh, that <coughs> sort of high watermark of that view of finance in academia was exactly when Soros, by his practice, was proving the efficient market hypothesis to be wrong. Uh, so he came at the whole thing with the view that far from equilibrium prices were actually to be expected. And again, that marked him off from others. And I think the third thing that Soros had, and oops, sorry, uh, yeah, it is, it, and this um, overlaps with you know what Eva was talking about, and I think hopefully shows the strength of the multi-author biography format, is this attitude towards risk. He did have an amazing appetite uh, for risk. Even other financial practitioners, such as Stan Druckenmiller, who ran the Soros funds uh, for about 11 years, was astonished uh, to watch Soros in action, the amount of uh, money he would put on a position. Other traders might develop a conviction um, and, and it would be the same conviction that Soros had and they would all bet X and Soros would come along and bet three X. He just had that risk appetite. Now, where did it come from? I think what's interesting um, in sort of the life in full um, sense is that you know, some of this may have come from his upbringing, the experience of mortal danger in 1944 as a result of the Nazi invasion and so forth, and watching his father handle risk. But I think you can also tell a compelling story that Soros's uh, risk tolerance was founded on the second point I made, that he just didn't think that markets were efficient. He came at markets under the influence of Karl Popper, the uh, LSE-based uh, philosopher who was a big influence on him when he studied and on his later attempts at philosophical writing. Popper's central idea was that human beings cannot apprehend reality uh, accurately and objectively. And to this, Soros added a, a second insight, which is that not only do traders apprehend the fair value of a stock or a bond imperfectly, the very imperfection of their assessment leads to a further departure from what an objective valuation might be. So for example, if people are unable to perceive the correct value of a stock, they come to a view that it's extremely valuable because it's gonna go up because the company's gonna do well. That flawed perception, uh, let's say it is flawed for the sake of argument, that flawed perception will actually be self-fulfilling and then the stock will go up and then more people will get excited and so the whole thing goes further and further from equilibrium. And so to him, when he saw something that looked as if it was a very inefficient price, he was willing to bet more than other people because it wasn't a scary anomaly. It was actually a confirmation of his basic view derived from Karl Popper that you should expect completely out of whack prices. So I think it's, it's interesting just to layer on the 1940s Hungary experience with the Karl Popper derived philosophical outlook to come at two ways of explaining that risk appetite. And, and the thing is that Soros had less of a strategic vision, <coughs> excuse me, than an instinctive one, uh, which is really quite remarkable. Uh, he wasn't following anybody's game plan other than his own. And, and Leon, I would say that yes, George is world famous. And the great majority of the people who heard of Soros know that he's also the target of really extraordinarily vicious attacks and conspiracy theories about his influence and his role in politics. And, uh, you know, he's conceived as some kind of ogre of the left. And uh, Soros himself, is, I would say has handled this with extraordinary uh, equanimity. Wasn't crazy about the fact that someone put a bomb in his mailbox. Uh, but this relentlessness of the tax, even during 
the Ukraine war, a state senator in Arizona announced that the real, the real culprit in the war was Soros and the Clintons. They were the ones responsible for the war. And uh, so Leon, knowing Soros as well as you do, and knowing the sort of whole basis of his mindset, what was it that made George this extraordinarily, extraordinary uh, sort of vivid target of people on the far right? So uh, Soros fits into a very familiar um, model, uh, and that is of the super wealthy Jew. So the Jew viewed in the European and the American lens is not truly a member of any of the nations that we think about, Polish, Hungarian, German. It's a, um, a construct of a cosmopolitan person and the extremely wealthy Jew, be it the Rothschilds, Bernard Baruch, whomever you want to think of. Um, there is this notion which was made very popular in 1903 by a forgery called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The idea that there are these few Jews or these internationalist cosmopolitans and they are come kind of puppet masters and in our time george soros fits this stereotype uh to a t um it was, it was a, not a new theory it was um it was made popular in the russian empire particularly in 1903 this forgery and is world distributed now so he um he is the one person who fits this model uh, absolutely, both for domestic American politics and internationally. We, we have to consider who is Soros. Soros is probably the most influential private individual in modern history most influential private individual, not because he's rich, but because he devoted so much of his time um, to, um, to political issues. And also, uh, as uh, Sebastian pointed out, also because he was a, an, an innovator in the whole world of finance. You know, I think of historical, he's kind of the Marquis de Lafayette of our time, but um, the Marquis de Lafayette wasn't a French aristocrat. The important thing about uh, uh, Soros um, is that um, I think uh, he developed early, uh, as Sebastian and Eva pointed out, a sense of impermanence. But the world is not about permanence, just as about markets are not about equilibrium. There's nothing permanent. And that the world is imperfect. The one encounter, he may think the 44 was a great year. I'm not so convinced his own version of this is accurate. But what he discovered is owning property, an apartment, your jewels, your family portraits, all the things we identify with permanence and stability are in fact not stable and not permanent. And they're not important. He was able to take risks because he's not afraid of being poor. He's able to take risks because he doesn't consider, as most of us do, the things we accumulate to be symbolic of the permanence of the world. Property in the end isn't important. Money really isn't important. And by the same token, he learned that the things we think are conventional values about normalcy, the idea that there's something normal out there, call it friendship, common sense, um, following the crowd. Um, what he learned is actually to do the opposite, to uh, consider that um, these things are, um, need to be critically looked at um, and they reinforce themselves in ways which uh, in fact end up often in disaster such as populism. And finally the most important thing about it is that the survival gave him an enormous commitment to two values, personal autonomy and independence and freedom. The idea that uh, the world and individuals uh, deserve um, uh, both freedom and rights, and uh, that um, in an unstable and impermanent world, you have to defend those who can't defend themselves, that the inequalities in the world uh, create um, cruelties and injustices which have to be um, um, fought. 
and that it is the arm of the state, whether it be Nazism or communism, and now let's say Putinism, that these kinds of despotic uh, controls over individual lives uh, have to be fought. Uh, that, um, and uh, uh, he is motivated by those ideals. So the combination of a willingness to confront the impermanence, the imperfection, and the fact that things we treasure uh, are things that we ought to think about being able to let go of, um, is all this is in the service of trying to create a politics uh, that actually um, is centered on personal freedom and autonomy. Excellent. Let me uh, try it just very briefly to summarize the sort of backstory of the book. Uh, it was the summer of 2020. George was turning 90. Ordinarily, there would have been a, a significant celebration of one kind or another. Uh, I have been Soros's book publisher for a quarter of a century uh, at Public Affairs. And I was on, on the phone Zoom <laughs> with him. And I, but what can we do, Mr. Soros, George? Because this is an extraordinary occasion. Uh, why don't you write your memoirs? And of course he told me he was absolutely not gonna do that. So what we proposed instead was finding people who would be able to dig so deeply into the various aspects of Soros's life and career that we would have in effect a, a biography of an extraordinary person in an unusual way. But what we needed in order to be able to do that was that Soros had to give us what essentially was the pledge that we could do this book, that he would cooperate and others would cooperate where we needed it, but they would not interfere. Uh, and it is a fact that this sort of Mr. Soros, his wife, D'Amico, and none of the other people around him actually read the book until it was done. It was an act of trust because the writers, all of whom are distinguished, wouldn't have been comfortable writing something that was essentially authorized. So while it was in fact, a, a, the original conception came through a discussion with Soros, it wasn't his book, it was ours. Let me very briefly tell you about some of the other essays. Uh, Michael Ignatieff, very distinguished, also writer, philosopher, has been the president of Central European University, which is the Soros-funded university, which is originally in uh, Budapest, but, but basically driven out by Orban, is now in Vienna. And what Ignatieff has done is show you how George's philosophical thinking enabled him to create this extraordinary higher educational institution, which I need to point out, does not ca carry his name. Uh, that among philanthropists is not typical. Uh, Gary LaMarche, who uh, until recently was the president of the Democracy Alliance, which is a, a major uh, alliance of progressive, wealthy progressives who support uh, progressive causes uh, and has worked with Soros was the first director of the US programs at the Open Society Foundations, which is George's foundations. And he kind of writes about, uh, he takes the, the origins of George's engagement in politics uh, up to the point which I think Leon has been talking about when his engagement with politics be, turned him into this paragon of uh, right-wing ignominy. Um, Orville Schell, the great China specialist, director of the Asia Society's China program. Uh, he was the person who brought Soros into, the, into China, where for many years, Soros believed that he could influence what was underway in China, which was the combination of a society with ambition and innovation and interest in making money, but also he could create civil society institutions. Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, 
has written about George's philanthropic, you know, after Gates maybe, Soros is the leading philanthropist in terms of the money he has uh, devoted to his causes. And what makes him different is that classic philanthropists uh, put their names on things and built things uh, or sponsored science or sponsored George Soros sponsors values. All of his foundations were meant to create civil society institutions all over the world devoted to open society values. And that in Walker's view is a unique form of philanthropic initiative. And finally, Ivan Krasyev, uh is, a, is part of that generation that came of age after the Cold War. And I would say in summary, what he writes about, uh, he's from Eastern Europe, Bulgaria. And what he writes about is the arc in which the early optimism or the hopes that the dissolution of the USSR would create a whole series of model democracies out of the former Soviet republics. What has been the trajectory, which as we all know now, uh, has, is, is, has not ended well. In, and certainly in the case of Russia, where Soros had placed great hope and uh, a great deal of money. At one point, as, as I recall, any scientists in, in the immediate posts Soviet period who needed it, got money from the Soros Foundation, from OSF. So I want to go back now to Ava. We're living through what we all acknowledge is a remarkable moment because this sort of post-Cold War era that began with 1991 and the dissolution of the Soviet Union is decisively over. Putin's invasion of, of uh, the Ukraine is, by any measure, the first time in since the end of the World War II that a one country has said, I want the other one. I'm going to take it, whether it wants it or not. One of the things that's very interesting to me, Ava, and you know so much about the Central European mindset, why do you think it is that Putin views Ukraine and these other places, other countries, Poland, Hungary, as belonging to him. What is it that makes the, this current notion, which so defies the Soros concept of open societies and democracies, what is it that is, can you imagine, drives Putin? Not sure that, you know, one can have complete insight into the mind of Vladimir Putin. Uh, but I would think that his enormous resentment at losing the empire, basically, um, you know, is, is partly driving what seems to me to be a completely insane venture. Uh, which is, you know, I would think not going to end well for him in Russia, um, as well as, as for the Ukraine. Um, he, I think, you know, is in his imagination, hearkening back to the wartime period in which the Ukraine was, you know, part of the Soviet empire, and also in which uh, the Soviets, as opposed to the Nazis, were on the side of the angels, I mean, comparatively speaking. Um, so, you know, it is a very tough question to answer. Uh, it is amazing that he keeps, you know, referring to Ukraine as an anti-Semitic state uh, now. Now, you know, there, there is a historical partial truth about it. Uh, there was a Nazi, pro-Nazi element among the Ukrainians during World War II. Um, and it was 
partly there because they hated the Russians more than they hated the Germans, because they had been persecuted by the Russians in you know, the most, uh, the most awful ways. I mean, the Russians basically caused a great famine of 1932, in which, you know, the Ukrainians were deprived of their crops and, you know, they starved and they ate their horses and, and worse. So, you know, they had horrible memories of, um, you know, of the Russians, of the Soviets. Um, at the same time, I think Putin still thinks of the Ukraine as his vassal state. Did I just say that? Uh, you know, he can't get used to the idea that it is an independent nation. Um, and I must say, you know, uh, that I, I think perhaps all of us are amazed by the, you know, degree of resistance that the Ukraine has put up. Um, so, you know, I think all of this is. Let, is let me th thanks, but let me bring it back to a bit back to the question of who, how George Soros became the person he is. Because what's striking to me in the way that Soros thinks and writes, and so on, and so many people like him in that part of the world their memories are very indelibly marked by the centuries of Russian domination, of anti-Semitism. When Putin talks about the quote, pro-Nazis or the script or whatever he calls them, neo-Nazis in the Ukraine, Vladimir Putin at 69 is talking about the Ukraine in 1944. And that's his, justification. Sebastian, the nature of this invasion is to completely upend uh, Russia's economy, uh, in which Soros at one time actually did a great deal of investing in trying to make the post-Soviet Russia into a major player on the world financial stage. What do you think is going to be the impact on Russia? Uh, now of the, of the invasion and the consequences. And what does it say about uh, Soros's efforts to change Russia? Well, there was a fascinating moment in the late 1990s when Soros's philanthropic efforts included a big effort to help the Russian transition to an open society. And when um, around 97, uh, you remember Russia defaulted um, in 1998, bringing down the, um, essentially foreshadowing the, the fall of Yeltsin and setting things up for the arrival of Putin. But in that year or so before the default, there was a struggle to kind of prop the system up financially. And Soros was engaged in secret loans to the Russian government to help it to stay afloat and meet its debt obligations. And one of the fascinating things about you know, the multifaceted George Soros, um, is that for a while he kept his philanthropic hat on when he was in Russia or thinking about Russia, and he kept his speculator's hat off. He deliberately didn't want to invest in the place where he was focusing his philanthropy. And by the way, he tangled these things up or separated them at various times in sort of unpredictable ways when he was trading in uh, East Asia during the Asian financial crisis. You know, in Thailand, he was happy to make a lot of money by going short the currency and predicting its collapse. In Korea, although his staff wanted to do the same thing and they could quite see how it would make a lot of money, uh, Soros himself refused to do it and preferred to visit South Korea as a statesman, a philanthropist, and in fact, to give talks about how speculation might be destabilizing, how it might be evil. And so there was always this fascinating sort of, you know, multiple persona side of George Soros, which makes it fitting that we have a multiple author uh, volume here. But going back to Russia, um, there was a moment in 1997 when he sort of cracked in this discipline that he had not to go into Russia as an investor. And he became part of an, a consortium which put money into the state-owned company Sviaz Invest. And what's amazing about it is that, of course, 
the premise for investing in a state-owned company in 1997 has to be that the ruble is not going to collapse, the political system is not going to collapse, the financial system is not going to be in the tank. And he did this, and he did this investment, even though with his other hat on, he was the philanthropist secretly propping up the finances of the Russian government. So he knew perfectly well how frail it was. And when he's tried to explain in his own writings how it was he came to put, you know, his, his financial traders war chest into a trade that as a philanthropist he knew was likely to go wrong. He has this most, I think, strange and fascinating explanation about how if he only had been a philanthropist in Russia, he would have been a sort of disembodied intellect, a kind of messiah figure on high. These are not my words, these are his words. And he had to descend from the mountaintop, again, his words, and become flesh and blood by investing like a normal rapacious capitalist is expected to do. And so he almost came down from the mountain, as it were, like a, you know, like a saint to save the sinners. And uh, the result was that he lost that investment in Svyazinvest and it went horribly wrong. But as far as I can tell, um, he is never minded about that. The people who did mind were the people working for his hedge fund, who then had to go and clear up the mess of his ill, his ill conceived investment. And it took them several years to get out from that hole. And and, and Leon, I'm going to slightly curveball you a bit because I was going to ask you about what the implications are for post Cold War world. But, but you know, I think I your relationship with Soros, personal, professional, is extraordinarily deep. You are yourself of a Central European background. You are yourself and a very innovative intellectual and an entrepreneur in, for example, what you've done with Bard. Tell me what you think is the way you confront Soros as a, both as a friend and as a, as, a, as a professional or whatever the proper term is. How do you, how do you confront, deal with Soros and get things done given the strength of his character, and if I may say so, <clears throat> the formidable nature of yours. So Peter, if I may, I'm happy to answer it as if there is a simple answer. I just want to amplify something you said. You know, so uh, Soros uh, did in the 90s uh, create a fund of 100 million to support the infrastructure of Russian science. Something that is interesting is uh, George is not the prisoner of history, he rethinks it. So he was a real advocate in the early 90s of a kind of Marshall Plan for Russia to um, to really, as, uh, as Sebastian suggests, invest in the future of Russia without resentment. Um, and the things that um, have happened uh, with Putin uh, are the things that uh, um, uh, Soros has always understood to be problematic. One is nationalism. And um, what Eva says about uh, Russia's right, this is a make America great again, flip a model in Russia, immensely popular, make Russia great again, restore its grandeur. And um, Ukraine uh, is, in their mind, the <coughs> home of Russia, the whole old Russia is located beginning in Kiev. So the idea that this is their place um, seems a kind of natural argument. And that Ukrainian nationalism, um, which has a long history, um, is something that uh, these national sentiments is paralleled by an extreme right wing Russian nationalism that has an unhealthy relationship also with religion with um, the church and, and the, um, the support that the church provides to Putin. These old devils, which um, have, have really created enormous bloodshed in this region, were the ones that Soros has always tried to fight. And I think he saw initially Russia as a place where it could be fought. And as Sebastian suggests, that gamble uh, didn't work out. It looked like it would work out. As far as dealing with uh, Mr. Soros, um, it, 
one of the most incredible things about him is that um, uh, he, um, the way to deal with him is to, um, to think independently, to contradict him, to confront him and to persuade him, uh, not to flatter him. You talk about philanthropists. Um, all of us are subject to flattery and uh, all of us are subject to um, uh, being told what we want to hear. Um, the way to deal um, effectively with Mr. Soros is to foreground the ideals that motivate you and your reasons and also not <coughs> be afraid to contradict him, to suggest that what he's saying, um, he has always liked a good argument, a good debate. Uh, and he's one of the few people I've known of, of success and authority who's willing to change his mind and to admit that he was wrong. How many people have you met who are willing to say, you know, I've been arguing this, and now that you, this, you might be right, I might be wrong. So it is um, what he is, he's constantly thinking and constantly uh, questioning. And people who get into trouble with him are those who think they can anticipate a sort of patterned reaction on his part that he'll take a position. What uh, Sebastian said about the notion that um, as you push a certain point of view, um, you detach yourself from the reality and the, his theory of re reflexivity so forth. So it is the independence of uh, your opinion and your willingness to get into an argument and even lose that argument. And um, also with the chance that you might win it. Uh, but um, I think we need to realize that um, in 89, Mr. Soros and a lot of the people involved in, in the foundations looked at this as a short game. The open society, we assume freedom is something that people want, autonomy is something that people want, um, diversity is what people want, dissent is what people want, it's not the case. Authoritarianism is a huge um, uh, popular base, conformism. People resent people who are different. People resent exceptional people. Um, and there is this resentment, we hear it all the time of elites. Um, and I think that the power of old myths of nationalism, we see it at work with Putin. Putin, I disagree. I think Putin might actually be successful. Uh, he will conquer oh. Ukraine. I mean, I think it will be a long, a long tragic saga um, and the resistance, it'll make the Russian control of Afghanistan look like a puppet theater. Uh, it's a huge country and it's gonna be very hard. Ukrainians might actually succeed in stopping him, but the, the, the idea of reconquering uh, an empire is wildly popular. Uh, Hitler got away with it in the thirties and um, uh, and uh, Putin might very well um, get away with it um, uh, in, a, uh, in an unspeakably cruel uh, and um, violent way. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I know fight, we're, supposed to go to, we're supposed to go to questions. Yeah, I just want to say the want... fight that he has mm -hmm. engaged in is a much tougher one than even he realized. Right. I think we would all agree and we would all wish Putin ill. Uh, so, uh, let me go to the questions which, uh, we have, and the first one is, ha, ha, I'm not at all surprised. The first question is, what is the reason underlying Soros's anti-Israel stance? Do you want to take that, Leon? I don't think he has an anti-Israel stance. I think that's, a, that's, um, that's not, not true. Um, he has, uh, he's, not a, he's not a Zionist. Uh, as many Jews are not Zionists. He's not unique. Uh, and uh, he is not a primary interest of his. But to call him anti-Israel, I think, is a mischaracterization. He's invested in Israel. He's visited Israel. There's nothing particularly... Um, he's not an enthusiast. He's not a Zionist. It's also a fact, um, and I, you know, I don't know why, but I suspect that this might be the first question. There's a kind of default, uh, often, 
in the assumption that Soros's motives are negative, uh, that he's anti this, he's anti that. I can tell you, having known him pretty well, not as well as Leon, but known him for a long time, he's deeply aware of his Jewish origins. He's deeply aware of what it meant to he and his family and to all those around him to be a Jew. He understands that the Hungarian um, attacks on him are, are anti-Semitic, but that doesn't mean that he looks at Israel and says anything it does is something that I have to approve of. There's nothing in Soros's personal background which suggests that he goes along just because he has to. Uh, the next question comes, I would say, rather dramatically from Shelby White, without whom we wouldn't be having this conversation. And she says, what does Soros think about the current situation? And she wants me to direct it to you, Leon. I, I, can't, um, I can't say from any direct conversation with him, but I am quite certain that he is, uh, has been already in 2014, a huge supporter of Ukraine and a huge supporter of uh, their struggle to resist the, uh, the, the Russians. Uh, the one thing that I think um, is included in Mr. Soros's concern is what, how to help the dissenting Russian community, one of the things we have to guard against is a kind of blanket anti-Russian sentiment. And there are large numbers of, of, of Russians who are horrified uh, and are in a, in a police state in which their lives are at risk. So I think that's probably not only the support of Ukraine, but also the support of um, the um, let's call it the liberal dissenting segment of, of the Russian intelligence and population. Uh, I am quite sure that he has uh, issued a statements in the last week or two uh, that could be easily found online. Um, I, 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 what Leon says is absolutely right. His interest in Ukraine, particularly after the yellow revolutions, Maidan and so forth was profound. He became a really major supporter of uh, of the democratic reforms in uh, in Ukraine, and, and, and they they have they have open society have has personnel there as well, yeah. Right, um, and then the next is a very interesting question. It's from Mary Hyatt. Soros has has he succeeded in getting progressive district attorneys elected in the U.S. And if yes, have they improved the way defendants are treated? Uh, who wants to take that? And maybe it should be, well, I can take that, I think. I think one of the, one of the misunderstandings of, of uh, that one of the misunderstandings of Soros' political engagement is that it's all about presidential politics and Congress and so on. Um, and in fact, increasingly, and with some success, the Soros political engagement is at lower levels. It's at the level of state and local government because of the belief that he has that what happens locally is very, very important. And particularly the areas that are of interest to him like criminal justice um, and, the, and the courts. So he's, he's been extremely active uh, in supporting- if I, if, I, if I may, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, there's a very Please important- do the public needs to know. There's the Open Society Foundations, which does not engage in direct politics. That's exactly that, right. And then there's Mr. Soros as a private philanthropist, as a private political contributor. Those are two separate uh, pockets, if you will. And I think what you say is absolutely right. Um, in the foundation, there's been a huge interest in the protection of people of poverty or people who are discriminated against and their access to justice. That's been a real focus, criminal justice, defendants, uh, courts, and, um, and the idea of a true uh, rule of law. And the foundation does that in a non political way. He himself, as you point out, has in fact uh, supported candidates locally who have uh, those values of equal justice. That, that's a really important distinction, Leon, thank you, because the truth is 
there's a tendency to lump everything Soros does into sort of one thing, which is, is not in fact the case. Open Society Foundations is a vast array of uh, interests and, and supports a vast array of issues uh, among you know, end of life <laughs> uh, and legalization of certain kinds of you know, marijuana and so on. Things that would, would add to a progressive agenda around the country that have nothing to do, um, as I said, open society principles, uh, social justice, civil rights, human rights. And that's very different from the po directly political uh, ways in which he has been active through PACs and so on. And here's, uh, I think, the last question, <laughs> which essentially goes back to the first. <coughs> You know, I've been, do <coughs> I've been doing this with a cold and I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to the end and so are we. Um, the, uh, it says, if I am correct, Mr. Herbert Weller says, Soros has placed few resources into the Jewish world. Why? Leon? Well, the, I think the reason is uh, simple. It's not his primary interest. Uh, uh, and uh, he's not an active member of the Jewish community. Second of all, um, there is no shortage of philanthropists who are primarily interested in the Jewish community, and um, uh, there is no uh, reason that, um, that uh, he should. Um, he has invested philanthropically in places that other places wouldn't, other philanthropists wouldn't go, and we should be thankful for that. Why should everybody run in the same direction? I don't think he has any obligation <laughs> to be active in Jewish philanthropy, um, and uh, um, he has um, uh, done a world of good uh, without focusing on that. This is not a person who thinks in, if I may say so, tribal or uh, essentialist views of identity. He is a citizen of the world in the best sense of the word. I want to close by really asking Ava and, and Sebastian one final question. Having listened to this, both of you uh, have written in depth and with real insight on aspects of the Soros character and his uh, life and career. What do you think, Eva, yourself coming from Central Europe, yourself having written so deeply about those issues, of what it means to be Central European, what it means to have been shaped by the Holocaust, what do you think the Soros legacy will be? He's 91, 10th decade. Yes. Uh... I think, you know, he, you know, his 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 works are there, you know, to be continued in the next generation. Uh, I think uh, he will be seen uh, as an altruistic philanthropist. Uh, <coughs> who, you know, who is very thoughtful. Uh, you know, how can, how can one summarize it? I mean, I think in a sense we have, you know, we have talked about all the things that he has done and I think, you know, they will be remembered. And I think, you know, he, in, in Central Europe, he will be remembered as the person who has contributed greatly um, to its democratization. I mean, there, you know, the, the process of democratization has really been successful. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, the, 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 you know, the wheel of history, the pendulum swings. And so, you know, there is no final point, but the democratization there has been extremely successful. Um, and so it, he will be, I think he will be remembered as, you know, doing good for its own sake. You know, and to make a, to make a point there, uh, Eva, when Henry Ford created the Ford Foundation, 
no one would have guessed that a hundred years later, the Ford Foundation would represent so many things that Henry Ford was opposed to. Um, and I think one of the amazing facts of the Soros legacy is going to be in the philanthropic and philosophical ways, do his ideas transcend the, the decades in the way that they were meant to, or will they somehow be redesigned? And, and Sebastian, I think we're, we really are getting to the close here. Um, what about what he's done to finance? What about what he's done into the way, uh, you know, you've just done this wonderful book on venture capital. Um, and, you know, I think everybody on this call will, will, will know what venture capital is. You know, it was the source of great deal of money into all the great tech places and so on. Um, what do you think Soros has done to the way we have, we imagine finance and may we imagine wealth? You know, I find myself um, citing his example when people in finance ask me the question, will everything be taken over by artificial intelligence? Because there's some kinds of financial trading where you mine past patterns and look for the way that you know, those could be exploited for, for profit and you create algorithms which computers can be better at than people. But the type of financial speculation that George Soros mastered is the kind where I don't think artificial intelligence will ever do that because it's not about playing the game. It's about looking for changes in the rules of the game. That is, you know, how George himself would put it. He would say, I'm not playing the game. I'm looking for changes in the rules of the game. And that is a sort of almost Renaissance man kind of challenge. You have to bring in insights from politics, insights from economics. You have to understand central banks. You have to understand company accounts. You might have to understand political shifts. You might have to understand you know, cultural factors. It's, it's just a multifaceted um, thing which sort of divide, defies algorithmic precision. And George Soros, without creating a big company, without creating an algorithm, generated extraordinary speculative profits over a period of 30 years or so. Uh, and, and it stands as a monument to the enduring influence of human intelligence in comprehending public affairs. I think, that's, I think that would be the summing up of this entire effort as we discussed it, which is the one thing you can say about George Soros, that he is a man, in, a life in full, a man in full, and very much a human in full with all the aspects of humanity uh, that are implied. And uh, that is why I think his various accomplishments are remarkable because, you know, humans have their limits and he's sort of been busting the limits in so many different ways. I think, I can't really 100% tell, but I think we're out of time. Uh, Kai, is that the case? If not, I'll, there are 15 more questions. Somebody want to help me out here? We hit the 705 mark. Yes, I think you're out of time, Peter. Ah, thank you, Kai. So what I should really be doing then is saying thank you to everybody. Um, and and to, to remind you that, that, that there's a book involved here and it's called George Soros, A Life in Full. It was published uh, by Harvard Business Review Press in, in, in uh, cooperation or collaboration with Platform Books, which happens to be the, the publishing company that I've created since public affairs. And <coughs> so it's, <coughs> and I, I'm gonna say there's a the show must go on concept to this. I'm gonna go back, put my head in the, and, 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 and take some hot soup. Um, anyway, thank you all for coming. And it was a very, 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 very interesting hour as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, bye-bye.